Don't call her cute. Don't call her feisty. She's a rebel. She is nasty. She is brave. She is a honey sweetie sugar pie baby. And don't you ever say that she was well behaved. Don't you ever say that she was well behaved. And don't you ever say that she was well behaved. Apparently, this is the first year that an openly gay man is competing in the Olympics for figure skating. <laughs> um, oh. I guess the thing was Johnny Weir um, was like came out after. Like he is came out already since then. Um, wait, I'm trying to think because he apparently I was listening to another podcast that was saying that he oh, his name is Adam Rippon. He's and apparently he has a great skater. yeah and he's going this year and it, apparently he has a great butt mm-hmm. and they all have great butts and people were like saying online that his butt was fake and then he what? like patted it and so he like <laughs> he did like a very like cool response where he was like no this is my butt <laughs> i feel like and it also, should be i would be so, more i'm in love with him it's like more appropriate if there's somebody who's like the first openly straight male figure skater yeah <laughs> like that's so crazy i know he wrote there's been a lot of questions to whether i compete with butt pads on and i'd like to set the record straight and let it be known that no it's just my real butt thank you for your interest <laughs> comments and concern love you <laughs> oh my god it's so funny um and he's like so cute oh Look he's really cute face oh my god so i'm excited about him that's mostly i don't know i end up never watching the like actual olympics but i don't have cable anymore Here's your computer back. I think you can just, I mean. I guess you can probably watch it online. Or, oh, I guess we we pick stuff up with the antenna. Oh, you have an antenna. We have an antenna. Interesting. On the top of our house. Weird. Oh, is it that thing? No, no, it's like on, oh, maybe it's that. (laughs) (laughs) But there's also one like on top of the house. Yes, antenna. Um, Which I've never noticed before. (laughs) I was like, oh, there it is. Those three feet long (laughs) antenna in the corner of my apartment that I've never noticed before. I guess it'll be like, actually, it starts February 8th and I'm flying to New Orleans for Mardi Gras February 7th. Are you staying in a hotel? No, I'm staying at friends' houses. I don't think... Oh, actually, one of them does have cable. Also, that I seems like... Both do. I mean, It'll, you can I just go it, to a I bar. I might end up... Yeah, I think I might end... But I'll be Mardi Gras. So like, I don't... That's going to mm. be my priority. I think I'll be like... that. I feel like that'll end up being something that I happen upon, you know? Like, last year, I think the Oscars happened while I was at Mardi Gras for, in New Orleans. And, like, one night after a parade, I, like, ended up at someone's house and, like, watched them. Um, so I feel like maybe that'll happen, but it's definitely not going to be my priority. Also, the first few days aren't as exciting anyway. Oh, really? I, I think don't, that, no, I mean, I, I think figure like, skating is usually at the end. It. What else is in the winter? Snowboarding and stuff. I like the snow. I like the aerial snowboarding. That's cool. Because it has my name. Wow. Um, no, I just love the flips. I love the one where they're, like... They go downhill. They're just like they're, it's a race, so it's as fast as they can go. But also they flip and stuff, mm, and they're judged on that crazy. as well. Do you ski or snowboard? I know you have a joke I've about this. I've never been. Oh yeah, well I guess growing up in Kentucky, that's not really a thing. Yeah, I mean was, I I grew up here and I've only been like a few times in my life. Did you go to like, Connecticut or Vermont or something? We went to Vermont. My fa- I have my aunt and uncle live in Vermont. And their kids, my cousins, came out like on skis and snowboards. Like they mm-hmm. are, they are incredible. Um, but so I visited them. Actually, the first time I ever skied was my senior year of high school. We went on a senior ski trip. It was just like a bunch of us that we or someone organized. I don't know. We had some like very like like on top of it people at my mm-hmm. high school because I went to this like nerdy high school <laughs> and so someone I don't even know who but like someone put it all together and like got us a block of rooms at a hotel I don't know where God, it people was who can Vermont do that or are something amazing. yeah like p- like a, an event planner like at age 18 or whatever yeah. and they like got us like a block of rooms and we took like a bus up or something I don't even remember how it happened but we went and I went on this senior ski trip so that was the first time I ever skied and it wasn't and it wasn't bad. It was, or maybe that was the second. I forget. Basically, but every time I, w- I've only been like three times total. Once Did you, on that, and then twice with my cousins. Were and, you able to like ski, ski? Yeah, I mean, like most, like every time, what would happen is I would start on the like bunny slope just mm-hmm. to like remember how to do it. And I, and every time I would go up to like the blue whatever, which is like the net, like 
not the easiest, but like the next mm-hmm. easiest, I think. Like it would be like real. I mean, I'm not going to go on a black diamond or anything like that. I don't go like, I don't know. And I don't know if I'd like it anymore. It's so cold. Yeah. It's so cold. Yeah. And being cold is so miserable. Yeah. And I've never been skiing out west, which apparently is like way better. Like in Colorado and stuff? Yeah, Utah and all that. Because apparently the snow is like fluffier and like mm. in in the northeast it's like more icy. Interesting. Yeah. Did you know that in Vermont there are no billboards by state law because they didn't want to block the view? I did not know that. It's very pretty if you ever drive through Vermont. Oh, that's great. The mountains are so pretty. Yes. Bernie Sanders. I know. Did you know that Vermont also has one of the lowest populations of African-American people in the country, but one of the highest African-American incarceration rates in the oh, country. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh. Bernie Sanders. That's, <laughs> less. <laughs> That's less of a fun fact. Yes, it is. But he's in touch with the people. Anyway, um, no, I no, it's cool. Vermont's nice. Um, I like it up there. I should go. I should, I should have, I mean, maybe I could still do it this winter. I should go up and visit my aunt and uncle. It's just like time flies, you know? But if you ever wanted to go skiing, we could go up to Vermont. I'd like to try. I mean, I like sports. Like I'd like to do it. Yeah, just to try it. I've just never had, I've never had the opportunity. It's been a long time since I tried it. Well, we could go anytime you want. Okay. I have, we have a place to stay and people who would take us on the slopes and everything. Yeah. Um, Do a show or two. Yeah, I know. Somewhere. Yeah, well, there's the Vermont Comedy Club, but I did send them an email with my tape and they have not gotten back to me. So. I'm sure they're just busy. <laughs> the holidays just happened. No, I think they were like a newer club and then people realized they're great. Mm. And I think I I think I hit, I think I sent that email a little too late, you know? That's so frustrating. Like if I had it's sent like, it like three months earlier, I bet I would have gotten a It's response. like, I think I got on Twitter a year too late. Mm. Like Shaggy and I were talking the other night. Uh, he was like, isn't it crazy how like people just get writing jobs off of Twitter? And I was like, that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. You don't get a writing job. Like it's a factor. Yeah. Or it can be a factor, but like nobody's just going through like You're that. Not gonna Megan Amram it anymore. Yeah. Or what was the other girl? Shell. I feel like her first name was Shelby. I don't know. I don't know. I just, I, yeah, I, I got on too late Yeah. for, for that to be. When did you get on? Um, 2009 oh. no 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 not that early no because I graduated college already so 2012 mm. I don't remember when I got on I mean I'm not great at it you're good at it you are good at it thank you though but you are good you can oh. write jokes girl yeah you got jokes I know but it's like I get overwhelmed when it, people are writing like topical things and then I'm like it stresses me out and I just don't do it I wait a day I like I don't really it feels like you're yeah. always doing stuff that's so topical but I don't do it as soon as it happens because mm. I, I don't want to make the most obvious joke yeah and so I let everybody do you make like their... write them out or how do you tweet like do you like do you like brainstorm a tweet or you just like think on it um if there's something go- well so part one of my new year's resolutions was to tweet a joke every day that's great um which has been very helpful like it makes like the more I do it, the easier it gets. Really? Maybe mm-hmm. I should start that as my New Year's resolution. You don't even have to tweet it now. if you just write a joke every day. Yeah. But topical stuff is helpful because yeah, it's it gives like you something to write about. Yeah. And so I, I wait for everybody to make all of their comments, and then I think of like what angle hasn't been taken yet, or like what point hasn't been made yet. And I sort of just but like haven't they all brainstorm. been made? They, like, haven't. they like, haven't. Like, because you have an individual <laughs> mind. Like, you have your yeah. own experiences. There are references that haven't been made. There are connections that haven't been made. Mm. Like, there are infinite. I think that's what I have to remember. And for a while, yeah. it was really hard. But there are infinite jokes about something. Okay, I want to believe you, but my I'm having resistance in my body. But I know it's just like an excuse. Yeah. So, but I it's hard. I like that you're saying that, and I should believe it. But and then some of them that. are just like, the more you think about jokes, the more the they more kind of just come to you. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, okay. What's tomorrow? Tomorrow's Tuesday. Maybe I'll start tomorrow. That's great. Maybe I won't, but maybe I will. Okay. Maybe I will. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Okay. I did. I mean, I, I told you, 
but I stayed up last night until 4.30 oh working God. on that packet. And as I was <laughs> falling asleep, I thought of a joke. Oh. And so I tweeted it and I was like, this counts for today. I'm going to be so tired tomorrow. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like this counts. Uh, oh my God. If you do, if you even do like five or six a week, that's still pretty good. But I mean, also I had just written to... three pages of, of a script. Yeah. Like, I had just written so many so jokes. Many jokes that day, but none of them that. really, tra- like one you, translated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that's awesome. I'm, I am excited for you with, about that. She's got to set goals. Yeah. That's the only way I can get anything done. Yeah. Is if I like write down something that you're going to do. Yeah. That's great. I used to for a while. I don't do it anymore and maybe I should start again. But on my way into the city, I would write down the things that I would like to accomplish for the day. Mm. And then the next day. On your phone? No, on a notebook. Mm. And that way oh, the next. you get a seat on the train because you're the last Yeah, girl. Time. And then the next morning, I would cross off the things that I had done the day before, before making my list for the day. Oh, Again, and there's that's like, a nice technique. Ooh, look at these hot techniques you're getting <laughs> on this podcast. Life tips. Wow. With Ariel and Molly. Mostly Ariel. I'm just learning. I'm in class, baby. There's something very satisfying about like crossing something crossing off of a list. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do I'm going to try that too. Have the I problem is like I can't mom. really like, like also when I was doing morning pages for a while. What's that? That's like the artist way thing where you write, you write like three pages oh, yeah, free yeah. write when you wake up in the morning. I am not a morning person. So it was like hard for me to wake up early. And then there was a moment where I was trying to do it like on the train, but like the chances of me getting a seat on either of the two trains that I take, mm-hmm. it's like pretty slim. And and, and you're, the point of it is you're supposed to do it first thing when you wake up. So really, you're, I mean, that was kind of cheating even when I was doing it on the train. Yeah. So I was just like, mm. I also just, I hate riding on the train because I feel like half the time there's some like nerdy boy looking at me wistfully of like, oh, she writes. I know. It just feels like such a waste of time. I'm also just like not <laughs> functional in the morning. I mean, yeah. my commute is an hour. So it's like, I should do something. But I usually so, do. I listen to podcasts. Mm. I listen to podcasts. And then, you know, yeah, maybe I should. Maybe, maybe, I'll, okay, I'm going to think on it and figure out if there's a way that I can, like, do. Because you know what I could do is I could listen to, like, the I listen to the daily and up first, right? Mm-hmm. So I could listen to those and then pick one topic that they said and then write a, try and write a joke about it. It's like when Yumi and Julie used to yeah pick out topics. Topics, yeah. And write jokes. I used to do, when I lived with Rob Hayes and Jake Head, we would sit and we would do a similar thing. But we would um, like scour the internet for headlines Mm. and we would each write like three or four headlines down on a post on a card Mm -hmm. and then we'd jumble them all up and then we'd pick one and we'd set a timer for like three minutes Uh and we would just write about it for it's cool. We would just write as many jokes as we could um, for three. And then we would also do the same thing with like uh, we would. I think Jake had a playlist of like random songs and he would just press play and you would free write for the duration of that song. And so it could be like based on a lyric from the song or just going. Yeah. It was just, do you think any of you have material from those sessions that you still use? No, but I don't think that was the point. That's not the point. The point is just, I mean, it's to clear the cobwebs, clear the cobwebs and get the, get the, get the juices flowing. Yeah. Get the the bullshit out of the way. All the analogies. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's great. That's really cool. So those are some hot writing tips. Wow. That you, you guys, can take with this you. is a whole, did you know that this is a comedy podcast and a history podcast? We really touch on it all. And a life advice podcast. <laughs> and a, and a chit chat podcast. Oh, we, we have a lot of categories that we, that we cover. If we're mm, being honest. I have a correction to make. Ooh. Um, from. Correction, correction. <laughs> I don't know what that From was. a couple of episodes <laughs> Man, ago. This one, I, to quote Shaggy five minutes before we started this podcast this one is hitting is that what he said something (laughs) like that i'm feeling the same way um so for my mom and dad were painting their uh, the house and first my mom texted me well she called i called her and we were talking and she was like who is the boy who didn't recognize you who you slept with the handsome one Uh and i just sent her a screenshot and she was like he is very handsome molly was right about the forehead yeah um but i'm right about i'm right about them all so when we talked about um 
how I said that my parents would disown me if I ever converted to Christianity. Yeah. Um, my mom said, uh, <laughs> very funny, but we want a retraction. <laughs> I'm glad. I was like, I don't, I was skeptical of that. We would never, ever disown you, even if you converted. We would wonder what was wrong with you. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> would wonder where we went wrong or what we did to you. <laughs> would cry ourselves to sleep at night, but we wouldn't, wouldn't disown, disown you. you. That's fair. I I'd say that that makes sense. Like that's like if I became a Republican. Oh God bless, never. But um, but I think that would be the same. my parents would never disown me, but they would be very upset. I think my, they would just have so many questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. It does. It goes against everything that makes sense. I just love that my mom was like. We would wonder what we did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we would cry ourselves to sleep. Also, like, I love that there was, like, so much Jewish guilt in that I answer. Know. <laughs> of course. <laughs> it was like, um, I mean, it would ruin my life, yeah. but uh, you do whatever you want. And, you know, it's hard enough for us to sleep at night <laughs> with the back pain and the anxiety over your student loans. But, uh, but no, but we or would do wonder. Whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> but we love you. Yeah. <laughs> That's truly funny i appreciate that uh, that's great i saw book of mormon oh this week. yeah what'd you think you. i really liked it okay i didn't love it that much you didn't love it no i mean i, I also have we, i told you that already or we talked about it i don't know if we did my only my real critique was that um for the first half of the show mm-hmm. the instruments were louder than the singers oh no and at first i was wondering because we had really good seats and so yeah. i was wondering if we were just too close but the second half it was fixed oh, so fuck. it made it really hard to That's like a, understand what they're saying to understand and i had to really focus which when you're really trying to listen to something you can't just relax and get yeah. lost in it wait that sucks i wonder how that happened but the second half was much better yeah. and the songs were so fun and i've had uh the baptize me song <laughs> stuck in my head I did. I, I recently saw SpongeBob the Musical, and I fucking loved it. Did you? I, I heard it was real weird. Freaked out. I loved it so much. I went with my friend Margot, who was visiting from Los Angeles. Okay, okay. now we are. Now we are. Hey guys, we had a technical difficulty again. <laughs> it just keeps happening. But at yeah, least it's the. But now we know what it's it the is. same one. We know what it is. I just like the car. The memory card is full because I just, you know, I'm not a tech gal. But I've been do- po- posting the podcast, but I need to just delete it after I- we're done with it instead of just leave it on there like a hoarder. I mean, look, this is a very like do it yourself podcast. Yeah. And it's like all like we don't have a producer. We don't have any tech people. No, it's, it's all us, but it sounds fucking good. So. Sounds amazing. You're welcome. And we're really just, you know, <laughs> figuring it out as we go. We haven't lost any more episodes yet, at least. No, that's I mean, we just lost the one with Guy. The only been, guest. So best one. Okay, <laughs> okay wait, but wait, finish, finish your. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically I go to see SpongeBob the musical with my friend Margo from college and then this guy who we went to college with. But I didn't really know him as well, but he's very sweet and he is a gay guy. And that's only important to the story because when we got to the like place where, to pick up our tickets, there were these like cheap tickets that he had gotten through like some program or whatever. They were like 40 bucks. Yeah. And he goes to pick up the tickets and he compliments the woman at the box office's necklace right away. He goes, that's a beautiful necklace. <laughs> and then we walk out. He like he gets the tickets. He gives us like a little look, like just you wait. And we get <laughs> to the lobby, and he's like, "We got upgraded." And so we were supposed to be like in the mezzanine, like uh-huh. way up, and we were fourth row for SpongeBob the Musical, and it was truly life changing and so good. But my friend Margot didn't like it very much because she didn't grow up watching SpongeBob, and also because she like has quote unquote taste or whatever. <laughs> Um, but me and but you loved guy it. loved it so much. The <laughs> costumes are amazing. I was saying the costumes are like, like really amazing Mardi Gras costumes. Like it's all made out of like garbage kind of, but they all look like beautiful. <laughs> it's so cool. like repurposed yeah. kind of thing. I would go see it again. I kind of keep thinking that I want to take like the the kid that I babysit to go see it, but I don't okay, have fun. any money. Yeah, <laughs> but I would love to go see it with a kid. Yeah, because they like they would lose their fucking minds. They would lose their minds. I can't tell if you would like it or not. I think he probably would. It's like super fun and weird. Um, and also, if anything's yeah. like visually exciting, it's very. It's so visually exciting. Well, well, also, some of the fun I will say is the way that they turn the classic characters that you know into people, and love that you know and love <laughs> into like people. So that's I, maybe that is part of why 
if you watched the show as a kid. I didn't watch it that much, but I just am familiar with it. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I loved it. Is so there much. a plot? Yeah, but like there doesn't need to be. <laughs> it's like not about. It's, that's not what you go for. Is the plot? Is my okay. mic on? Wait. Oh, oh, there I am. Is it not seeming? That? Okay, that's better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Compliment people. Also, that's something I learned from the Amazing yes, Race. Compliment people. It really helps. Is um, there were so many instances. There, my favorite. I guess was it season two. Um, there was this one pair they were both gay men Mm -hmm. but they weren't together Mm -hmm. they were just best friends yeah and they were from miami beach and they were wonderful um and they were just really nice and like they weren't that competitive until the end they Mm. were kind of just like we're just here to see the world like they were just very fun and every time they ended up catch like getting upgraded or like getting stuff before everybody else did because they were just really nice to people that's do you know what it helps because everybody else is like pushing and shoving and freaking out and, and they were just freaking like hey out. girl <laughs> yeah they were like excuse me uh could you help us please and they were like yeah you're the first are they person. french no one was cuban oh oh, oh. <laughs> so, that's cute to... yeah like the it's cute ben cute ben yeah that's they were it's definitely was like the compliment of a of a gay man to a woman about her necklace got us like seats that probably should have cost like Two hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> yeah. Like, so that was dope. I mean, dope my as book hell. of Mormon seats for free. Yeah, baby. They throw. That's pretty dope. Aisle. I it know. When really I saw great. Book of Mormon, I also saw it's it in really literally great. the last row. So <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a different experience if you're close up. I just loved like how cheesy it was. You know, like yeah, how cheesy and then immediately dark. Did you feel like some of the? It, did you feel a little dated to you? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I think that that's. I don't know. I don't know why. I'd, I like. I think maybe I set my expectations too high. People just were like, "It's amazing. You're ne- you're gonna love it." And I was like, "It's fine," but I. I don't know. I really liked it. Yeah. Um, didn't do it for me. I do think, I do think there's something about, and I was like thinking about it, like what is funny has changed in the last mm-hmm. two years. Yeah. Because we've gone through a huge, and it's more than two years old. It's like, ten, it's yeah, like, it's like five, five, six, seven. It might be seven or eight years right. old. It's all, it's old. I mean, I mean, there were a lot of like Team America e jokes, like yeah. the jokes about like everybody having AIDS. I was like, all right, like yeah. maybe if I hadn't seen Team America, this would be funnier to me. But it just, I think yeah. also I'm like, well, there's like, I mean, not that it's like under control necessarily, but it's like it's not as bad as it used to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't resonate it's as much. It's not quite as yeah. I, st- I maybe if saw- they changed it to Zika. I would- <laughs> Yeah, they gotta update those references. <laughs> um, Louis and I saw John Lithgow's one man show. Oh, how is that? Very boring. Um, <laughs> wow, 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 wow! It was rough. I mean, I fell asleep. I don't think that's ever happened to me. I truly fell asleep. I, uh, God, it was really say something rough. nice and then say something okay. True. It was cool <laughs> to see John Lithgow in person. Great, and there were parts when he like the whole concept of the show is that he like his dad was like a thes this like theater creator this thespian in the midwest when he was growing up and his childhood was really crazy and like fun because he had a bunch of siblings and his dad was this like wacky theater maker <coughs> who would create all these shakespeare festivals and like they would travel all over the place and so the part where he was talking about his life was like kind of interesting mm-hmm. but then he shifted to this thing where he was like now one thing that my dad used to love to do is is tell stories from this classic book of stories and he had like the physical book or whatever and he was like and i'm going to tell you two stories from that book so then act one is one story and act two is another story and it's just him telling the story and it's just (laughs) like i don't know the second one is like british and it's like that british kind of thing i Mm -hmm. don't know it was just like it was sort of dull I feel bad I love him and I was excited to see it and I really didn't like it yeah Yeah. that's okay you don't have to like everything not everything's for you no I don't know who that's for though (laughs) like it's for people who have like sleeping problems I had a similar experience when I saw what was it like lady in the lady with a van or lady in a van or something like that Hmm. it was hold on I gotta find it because Shaki and I one day we were just in the city together we had some time to kill it was like before we lived together and 
we were like, let's go see a movie. And mm. the only thing that was playing was like this movie. Oh, what was it called? Lady with the Van. Yeah, The Lady in the Van. Oh, I and never heard of it. It's, I mean, Maggie Smith is in it. Mm. It has like good reviews. It has an 89% on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm. So, like, okay, let's go see this. And I remember him saying, like, I don't know. And I was like, it has good reviews. Like, let's just go see it. It's playing right now. We go in. It is. I mean, we are the youngest people in there by <laughs> by 40 years. Oh, no. 50 for me. But <laughs> I'm, I'm younger than him. Ooh, forever um, young, baby. And it was so boring. <sighs> and so. What was it about? It's about a lady in a fucking van. <laughs> That's what it's about. No, it's about bad. this like That's sad, pl- lonely playwright. Mm. Who, and there's this lady in a van who at some point murdered somebody. And she then goes a little cuckoo and is hiding from the police and is living in her van. And she's homeless and she loses her mind. And and they fo- they forge a bond of sorts. And it is so long and so I don't boring. Care about that. And look, I've never written a movie before. Like I'm not shitting on anybody's no. stuff, but that was not for me. No, but you've watched a lot. I we watched <sighs> The Post recently. That's a movie. It was, me and Louie, and then we had a friend in town who was who was on our couch, and he watched it with us. And we just kept joking before we started watching the. Like, both of us were like, we should watch the post, but it felt like homework. Yeah. Like, yeah but yeah. we had the screener, and we're like, Tom Hanks, Meryl Streep, like <laughs> we <laughs> should <newspapers>. watch this. <laughs> Steven Spielberg. <laughs> we're like, but then like Louis kept making all these jokes about newspaper movies, where he was like, a lot of typing, <laughs> like, a lot of, like, <laughs> like a lot of filing. And so every time, like in the, when because he was making those jokes before, and then we watched the movie. There was like there literally was like <laughs> frantic filing yeah. <laughs> like, okay. clicky clack 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 of the it's typewriter so much. It's so so, and like and like shuffling papers it's Although, like have so you heard stupid the, the story of the woman who wrote the post i did hear that That's story crazy right she didn't she just write it it's like her first script and then it got in the hands of it what's her, her name first that, like, script, and she was like producer. i mean i guess i might as well like give it a go you know i yeah. should just try yeah, <laughs> that's and pretty Steven dope. Steven Spielberg was like, I'd like to make this. Yeah, well, I think it got in the hand of like a produ- this f- producer woman or something. And that's how they got all the people. I don't know. Yeah. But what we're saying is follow your dreams and life isn't fair. Yeah. Both those things are true. Tr- crazy. But that movie, I, it was like good, but it was also like boring. <laughs> sure. <laughs> both things Any important once. movie is. It was both things at once. Um, Shall we do the point of this discuss <laughs> Discuss the lives. <laughs> Of fascinating women? Yes. Okay. So um, this, by the way, you're listening to yeah. Well Behaved. It's a podcast. About women's when history. Already. Yeah. Hopefully. Unless you're like my grandma and you don't know what's happening, um, how you got here. But that's because we put it on your phone once. Maybe you're this you're just mm-hmm. listening now. Um but it's a podcast about women in, in history who maybe you didn't know about before you listened to this and now you're like, Oh, I got some fun things to talk about Just at a so cocktail party. Yeah, there are some fun facts and in, in here. So and, many facts. And look, like we get erased from history mm. as women and mm-hmm. it's important to learn about Drawing and it's just them back, fun. baby. It's just fun. It's a fun little story. Um I'm yeah. going first. Yes, you are. So, oh, and that's Ariel Elias. Oh yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and I'm Molly Rubin. That's Long. me. I'm Ariel. Okay. All right. We did the intros in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Well, who cares? Whatever. You know what? What is format, right? Like, we, we like to play. Yeah, we, we don't follow the rules. We are experimental here. We're not these well-behaved <laughs> women. <laughs> Ever since I saw SpongeBob the musical, I'm really <laughs> <laughs> becoming the most eccentric version of myself. Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. Who's your woman? My woman is, uh, is well, let me start with a little story first. Wow. Because I like to set it up. What are you, John Lithgow? <laughs> like to say, <laughs> Act one. <laughs> the times of, from my father. Oh my okay. God. It's 1973. And gathered at Lowell Hall at Harvard University is a protest of young women, young students. Wow. They're carrying jars full of yellow liquid. And they are participating in what will be, what will come to, oh boy, I was very tired when I wrote this. <laughs> These words are not in the right order. They're participating in what will become known as. There it is. Is that right? That's okay. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what will become known as. The great Harvard P in of 1973. <sighs> wow. And the woman who's leading them is Florence Flo Kennedy. And Florence, just if you want to look her up. Her name is I, Flo and she let a piece it in. 
Yeah, yeah. Do you have a lot of jokes about that already? I didn't make a single joke come about on. it. But <laughs> I, I really dropped the ball on the That's, jokes on this one. No, it's totally fine. Just That's so you know, Florence is spelled here. with a Y. F-L-O-R-Y-N-C-E. Ugh, that's annoying. Yeah, but she was great. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so Florence Kennedy was born on February 11th, 1916 in Kansas City, Missouri. Her dad was a Pullman porter, which were these, um, it was all black men who worked as porters on the sleeping cars on trains. Mm. And like, that was really interesting to just like go into that because... They were named after George Pullman, who was the guy who was Mm -hmm. like, uh, there should be sleeping arrangements for people on trains, but, uh, and hired former slaves. Mm. Um, But like people were assholes and kept calling all of the porters George because there Mm. was a, a tendency or like a, people would often name their slaves after their masters And so by I know it's already a problem. And so they would call these black men who are working as porters, George, after George Pullman, Uh. which like, fuck you. And so (laughs) um, at some point, I think I was reading a thing and it was like the people who took most offense to this were the men named George. (laughs) And so they created the Society for the Prevention of Calling Sleeping Car Porters George. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which eventually had 31,000 members. Whoa. Yeah. That's funny. So that's, that's just a little side story. But sweet, her dad was... So her dad was one of these porters. Oh, so she was black. Yes, she okay. was black. Um, and then later he had a taxi business. Okay. Florence was one of five girls. And they were very much raised to not take any shit. Mm. Um, they had bought a house in a white neighborhood, which not everybody in Missouri loved. Mm. Uh, one time, Flo's dad stood outside all day with a shotgun to ward off the clan who was trying to chase him off because they didn't want them in this white neighborhood. Cool. Um, but Many they were good people on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and they were taught that basically her parents were like, if your teacher is being a racist asshole, you don't have to respect her. And you can question Dope. authority. Um, she said... Dope, but dangerous. <laughs> what? Dope, but dangerous. Yeah. But it seems like it worked out okay. It, it worked out well for Florence. Um, she said, quote, if they threatened to hit us, we could act as if they weren't anybody we had to pay attention to. Hmm. And this kind of reminded me of you, but their parents rarely criticized them or said anything... <laughs> <laughs> like bad to them or I negative know. it's not the best it's okay it's I mean it's so different from being <laughs> Jewish <laughs> so I know I'm like so fake Jewish <laughs> um I Literally, mean I will oh wait uh, there's this uh uh, I can't. I probably can't say all of this I'll tell you the context around it let me see if there's like but there's something that happened to there was something going on in my brother's life and I was talking to my mom about how he should uh how, how she should like be more pushy about what he should do uh-huh. and she was like i don't think it's a parent's place to be pushy like that oh my god and I was like, <laughs> oh my that god that was pretty big right you can't tell what yeah, that was I have about no idea. okay okay i'll tell you what it is later <laughs> oh man no I, my I brother get... listens so i just don't want him to get upset <laughs> but i think that was very vague yeah. that was great i'll get i mean i'll talk to my family after this and i will get comments from my brother and my mom about what i should do differently <laughs> <laughs> i love you guys so much but you gotta stop um she said, Florence said, uh, quote, by the time the bigots got around to telling us that we were nobody, we already knew we were somebody. So it really worked for her. Mm. So Florence is growing up in Kansas City. She's taking various jobs. At one point, she owns a hat shop for a while. Uh, and like, it's nothing too exciting until her mom dies and she moves to Harlem with one of her sisters in 1942. Mm. And she figures... Uh, well, as long as I'm in New York, just making sure it's still recorded. <laughs> wait, wait, when was she born again? She was born in 1916. Oh. So she like graduates from high school. Okay. She's, she's doing these like odd jobs. So 42. Yeah. She would be like 30 already. Huh? Or, or late twenties. Late twenties. Cool. Okay. Um, I think she was 26 when she moved to, yeah, 26 when she moves to Harlem. Cool. Um, she's so she and her sister move to Harlem, and she figures like as long as I'm in New York, I might as well get an Ivy League education. She said like True. she didn't move to New York for school. She just figured as long as it's here. Yeah. So she applies uh, 
to Columbia. She graduates in 1949 and then figures like, as long as I'm here, I might as well go to law school. Yeah. So she applies to Columbia Law and gets rejected. Mm. And she's like, that's bullshit. So when she asks asks the dean why, he's like, look, Flo, it's not because you're black. I know you're thinking it's because you're black. It's not because you're black. I'm not racist. It's because you're a woman. Oh. And Flo was like, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, you're discriminating and I'm going to sue you. Tight. <laughs> so uh, he's like, okay, you can come to school here. <laughs> um, so she was one of eight women in the school and the only black person. Wow. So, the only black person. Yeah. So wow. she pro- it probably was because she was black. Yeah. But this like sort of set off a light bulb where she's like, oh, intersectionality like yeah um and she sort of becomes very determined to create an allyship between white feminists and black activists Mm. and she's like there's got to be a way for us to work together man has she found it (laughs) because sort of she did she did a lot better than it used to be um it is interesting though because it seems like from reading all of this like she was very well known at the time um and Mm -hmm. has just been forgotten Mm. because we tend to do that to black women especially like during the second wave of feminism or whatever so she graduates from law school and then Florence opens up her own practice which like doesn't get so much business Um, she does at one point I didn't like really talk about this that much but at some point she ends up uh, negotiating like the estate of Billie Holiday and Charlie Parker mm. which is kind of interesting but That's I think cool. she wasn't so fascinated by it mm. um, it's just like a cool thing she did but yeah it's just like this not really her happen. passion yeah um, she ends up having to take a job at Bloomingdale's at some point to pay the rent mm. and she marries this guy who's a fucking writer of course who's like 10 years younger and a huge alcoholic mm. which like he might as well just be a comedian then at that point yeah close um, enough he ends up dying a few years later and Flo said, uh, quote, anyone who marries a anyone who marries a drunk Welshman doesn't deserve the sympathy. Sorry, I kind of stumbled upon that uh, over that because I'm a little drunk. Um, you're a drunk Welshman. She never married again. She seemed pretty adamantly against it as a concept. Yeah. Saying, um, I'm with you, girl. <laughs> Are you, do you not ever want to get married? I don't know. I'm doing, I'm working on this bit right now where I talk about how I tried on it. Did I tell you I tried on an engagement ring? No. Well, it's not. My, my great grandmother left a ring with my mom that was supposed to go to me, and I always knew it was supposed to go to me, but I always was like, I'm not going to get married. Mm-hmm. And then when I was there for New Year's, there was like a bunch of my female friends were there, and somehow we were drunk, and we were like, ooh, let's try, and, they, and like some people had wedding rings on, or whatever, like engagement rings, and I was like, oh, I have one, don't I? And like my mom was like, yeah. <laughs> and so I like got her to let me try it on. Now it's really nice, and my mom keeps it and wears it on like special occasions, like when mm-hmm. she does, when she like, it's nicer <laughs> than the one she has. Yeah. So she was like Is it hesitant to give mom's up. mom's mom? My mom's mom's mom. Mom's mom's mom. Okay. My, my great grandmother. Like smuggled out of Ireland? No, no, no. This is the Jewish oh, side. Right, right. I'm Jewish from the, the mom's Holocaust. side, even though I'm not very Jewish. I'm technically Jewish. <laughs> yeah. No, it's we're not. Happy smuggled. They, were already, they were already here. She just had very good taste. Okay. Um, and it was just, and I put it on and, I, and it was like, it like really fucked me up. I'm Did like, it? It's it really, different. well, it's like really nice. It's like really nice. <laughs> It's really nice. You could just wear it. Mm. Like, who cares? Well, I don't even think. I, I, even if I got engaged, I feel like I would have to, like, the way my mom does, like, make that one for special occasions. Like, it's so, mm-hmm. it's, pre- it's like, really nice. Like, too nice. It's really nice. Okay. <laughs> anyway, but I'm so anyway. not sure. But I don't think that's a reason to get married. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. But. Well, you're, you'll appreciate this. Florence said, why should you lock yourself in the bathroom just because you have to go three times a day? It- <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny yeah, she's very funny oh my god i love that <laughs> she loves bathroom stuff there's a lot she of bathroom really does. Vibes. you know what? she wasn't shy about what it's like to be a human i love that <laughs> why should you lock yourself in the bathroom just because you have to go three times yeah time? that is that's oof. how she felt about marriage Apt. very good <laughs> so she at this point like her dumb husband died 
she feels like she needs a change and mm-hmm. she starts to get involved with these young activists and she's mostly by taking up their causes and representing them in court. So mm-hmm. in 1968, when women protested the Miss America pageant pretty famously, mm-hmm. um, and that's when like the sort of like burning your bras, uh, like stereotype started. Mm-hmm. Uh, they would burn their bras outside of the pageant, right? Yeah, because, it, but they were, I think, and I didn't read so much up on it, but it was like, they were kind of like burning everything that was symbolic of of like quote unquote women yeah. you know what I mean so it's not like every protest you went to women were just burning their bras mm. it was like expensive they're so expensive <laughs> yeah. it was like no at this thing where you're like quote unquote representing femininity like they like they were throwing fake eyelashes and like nails and burning bras. yeah so, yeah yeah um but a bunch of women ended up getting arrested and so Flo represents them in court and she just like she she just started taking on these huge cases and said, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up space. Mm. Which I also really love. That's she got good quotes. She is so quotable and notable. Yeah. She <laughs> represented twenty one Black Panthers who were on trial for conspiracy to commit bombings. Well. Um, she got them off, but she also brought them to Fire Island to go to a restaurant that she knew didn't serve Jews or black people because she was like trying to create a ruckus. Mm-hmm. And when she was asked if that was really the thing that they should be focusing on, like in the middle of this trial, she was like, yeah, because if we're, if we're fighting oppression, we have to fight it on all fronts. Mm. Right. Like if, if we're saying, and she believed like if we're saying that, and I believe too, but like that racism affects all aspects of life then we have to fight it in all aspects of life. Mm -hmm. So um, she also said at one point that like her goal was like, as far as um, like fighting for like fighting against oppression, like one of her tactics was to make white people uncomfortable. Mm. So she also sued the Catholic church for interfering with abortion. And this is like in 1968. And then she took it a step further and organized a bunch of other feminist lawyers to challenge the constitutionality of New York's abortion restrictions. Um, And then because of that challenge a year later in 1970, New York passed the most liberal guidelines for abortion in the country, which like, she largely made happen. Um, and just for reference, Roe, Roe v. Wade wasn't for another three years. That's so amazing. Like New York's like on the forefront, which was like also kind of a crazy story of what happened um, like to get that law passed. Mm-hmm. It was such a fluke and nobody thought that it was going to happen. Basically what happened was like the law, the bill that they wrote to give women greater access to abortion was so liberal that the Catholic church didn't bother protesting it because they were like, there's no way this is getting passed. Wow. And it was a Republican controlled state Congress. So like nobody even like put up that. And you know, like the, all these groups that exist now, yeah, like didn't exist then. Mm-hmm. So they were just like, yeah, whatever, like bullshit, yeah, like no way. Happen. And these lawmakers were like, I mean, yeah, if they had put up, if they had like made more noise, we probably wow. would have voted against oh it, God. but they didn't. So, That's um, awesome. yeah, it's crazy. And like part of what was so revolutionary about the law was that it didn't require women to have New York residency to have an abortion in to New have York. an abortion in New York. That's great. And so the first year after the Unlike law, went- the Met. Yeah, <laughs> like, not like the Met. Not like the Met, where you will have to have a New York residency yeah. to hey, go the there Met, for free. Yeah, hey, the Met, how does it feel knowing that Republicans in 1970 <laughs> were more progressive than you? <laughs> yeah. How does that feel? <sighs> um, and so the first year after the law went into effect, 60% of abortions were performed on women from out of state. Wow. Yeah. That's like, it's like Ireland and England. Abortions yeah. illegal in Ireland and people and women, like thousands and thousands of women every year just go to England and get an abortion. I was talking to Katie Boyle about that. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, she, her, her mom has something to do with. Really? Like, I should talk to her about it. Yeah. She, like, something to do with, I think, like, challenging that. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I have a cousin who's a, such a smart, she's like, a, such a smart lawyer and she teaches law at a university in england but she's irish and her and a fellow irish 
lawyer have like written a lot of papers about the legality of abortion in Ireland and they they were saying that like they they like they when they write them like writing them and presenting them they know that it's going to like hinder their ability to like work in Ireland potentially like oh, if wow. it doesn't go the way that they wanted to and stuff like that it's like really risky to even talk about it because what is is, like you can only get an abortion if it's incest or like rape is that the law i'm i don't even i don't know i mean there's a there was that famous story that happened several years ago in ireland where uh, i think she was i think she was indian but she was from another country and her she was here like her husband was they were in ireland and her, her husband was like working at a hospital or something like that they were living in ireland because of some job of her husband's and she like went into early labor and it was a dangerous pregnancy and her life was at risk and the doctor refused to give her an abortion and her and the child died oh my god in ireland that was like a few years ago yeah it's very catholic (laughs) yeah (laughs) so it's but yeah and just so just that was like a huge stink i'm not sure if there was like a thing that happened as a result of that or what but but in general just irish women are just going to england it's not like they're not doing it and then it's like the poorer women can't do it well and that was a big thing with this law in new york was like if you can travel wealthier women especially even in new york like even new york residents wealthier women already had access to abortion it was the poor women who were dying yeah and I mean that's even that's true today like when I was living I mean I have a joke about it when I was living in Louisiana if I had needed an abortion I would have just flown home to New York like why would I bother although I did always say it would be like kind of fun to like make a documentary about it but I also really love that joke you had about like riding that underground railroad right up north abortion underground railroad yeah (laughs) right up north to freedom yeah it's (sighs) fucked up you should get let you know Women are going to have abortions either way. It's, you can't, just whatever. Yeah, let you, if you're listening to this podcast, you already you know get that. that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, so, th- but it was, it was pretty cool that she. Yeah. So she's a big part of that. And then in 1971, Florence Kennedy founded the Feminist Party, which mm. was the party that nominated Shirley Chisholm cool. for president, which we talked about in an earlier episode. And then she started lecturing alongside Gloria Steinem. Um, they were, I think like, Gloria said they were like the Thelma and Louise of whatever. Mm. But Gloria <laughs> would, I'm calling her Gloria. <laughs> Gloria Steinem, we're on a first name basis. I feel like we would be. She said <laughs> she, like Gloria Steinem, would insist on going first because there was no way she could follow Flo. <laughs> like she was such a good speaker. And then a lot of times it was like really common for men to heckle them by a- like shouting out if they, asking them if they were lesbians. Mm. And Florence would respond, that depends. Are you the alternative? <laughs> <laughs> She's great. Hell yeah. Uh, People magazine r- magazine wrote that she was the biggest, loudest, and indisputably the rudest mouth on the playground. <laughs> and then she became known for often wearing a cowboy hat, pink sunglasses, and real fun clothes. Whoa. Yeah. There's a picture that I think we'll probably post like when we put up the episode mm-hmm. of her like she also has sort of like a gap in her teeth like me which we really like her um but she's like wearing you know the cowboy hat and whatever and just flipping off the camera with a huge smile on her face that's awesome i love it and then so she was like very well known among activists and civil rights groups which is why in 1973 she organized the pn Hmm. Oh, so harvard at the time had no female or co-ed bathrooms outside the dorms um oh my god And Harvard was making an effort to get their student body. They wanted a 50-50 ratio, like a a 50% female, 50% male, which they finally achieved in 2007. Um, But this is many years prior. I would do math, but I'm not going to. Damn. Yeah. Like 40 years later, they were like, oh. Um, Oh, no. 34 years later. But they didn't think about how the infrastructure itself was designed to exclude women. Mm. So they're like, women, like, come to our school, da 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 But also, we don't have any bathrooms for you. Like, uh. it just didn't occur to these guys. Right. So Lowell Hall only had one bathroom, and it was for men. So women, had, if they had to go to the bathroom, they had to leave the building and cross the street to use the bathroom which was a huge problem especially during during final exams because you're hidden figures 
What? Did you see that movie Hidden Figures? I didn't see it. <gasps> I haven't seen this it. It's kind of a plot point in that movie. Oh, going to the bathroom? Yeah. Huh. There's like not a there's not like a black bathroom for her and uh, it's a whole thing. Yeah. You should see that movie. I know I should. I, I have it. I should. On yeah. Uh, we have the screener. I think it might Just be kidding. on we destroyed I feel like it's it. on HBO Go now or something. You're supposed to destroy them. Oh, are you? Really? You supposed to, how? Are you supposed to burn You're them? Just like break it and burn it or something, yeah. Like a Which like Inspector totally do, Gadget. So don't yeah. worry about it. They should <laughs> make it like I feel like there should be a way to make it not work anymore after a certain time. Right? Yeah, they've got to have oh, that technology. They're probably gonna do that eventually, but for now they don't have that. Okay. Well um, anyway, but so yeah, they So yeah. It's a huge problem during final exams. You have less time to take the exam if you're a woman and you have to pee. Yeah. So you have like this disadvantage. And so after being ignored by the administration, these female students approached Flo to help them organize a protest because she was like, she was also very well known for, she was a good grassroots organizer, mm. which have you listened to Keep It, that podcast? Yeah. 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 And they, they were talk talking about, about that. Yeah. yeah. It made me think of that, of how like, if you haven't listened to that podcast, you should, I think like if you like us, you would really <laughs> like that podcast. Um, it's very different, but it's great. But it's cool. Um, but they talk about how one of the problem, like with the Golden Globes of this um, Time's Up movement, the Time Up. Yeah. The Time's Up movement is like it didn't seem like anybody really wanted to put in the work of organizing or knowing how mm-hmm. organizing a protest really works. And the idea of just like putting on a black dress or like wearing a pin isn't it was like halfway there but it wasn't fully realized and there was right. like they talk about the things that they could have done that would have had much more impact yes because organizing is a skill it's not just something that happens yeah um which is not inter- because i think like growing up when i would hear about like civil rights or whatever you have this notion in your head like i think it's sort of taught that it is the spontaneous thing without realizing right. like all of the planning and strategy that goes into it right so, um, <clears throat> Flo decided, so Flo was like, yeah, I'm totally going to help you do that. She, um, decided that they should do a pee in mm-hmm. and they made fake urine and put it in jars. Um, they made signs that said to pee or not to pee. So Harvard, <laughs> we get it. You're and, smart. uh, will the Dean let women use his personal toilet? Well, less catchy, less catchy, <laughs> but yeah. still um, very effective. And then she read a poem about pay bathrooms. She's like, oh boy. Pay also, bathrooms? Um, the bathrooms that you have to pay for. Oh. You know what I mean? Like the, there's one in Bryant Park. Wait, but why'd she read a poem? I don't know, man. Okay. That's just the fucking all right. story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then one by one, they all dumped the fake urine out of the jars onto the Harvard yard. Mm. Or the Harvard yard. real urine. What? I wish it was real. Well, so at one point, a female student walking by was like, y'all need real pee? I got real pee. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'll pee right here right now. Y'all need pee? Like, why, why aren't you using real pee? I assume she was Southern. Yeah. That's such a <laughs> um, and Florence was like, I love your enthusiasm, but no, like, we're not going to use real pee. This was... Uh, symbolic. What? It's symbolic. Yeah. And she was like, this is a warning. This mm. is our, like... Like, if they don't do anything, we'll come back next year and pee for real. Yeah. But, like, first, let's just show them, like... Yeah, make a statement. Yeah, let's not piss them off. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) So, that happened. Cool. And then Florence kept lecturing. There, I there's so much about her, and there are so many stories, and I couldn't squeeze them all in. Yeah. Um. But like, I do really. I think I, like if you're interested in her, you should read about her. Um. She kept lecturing. She was. She like really wanted to unite these like white feminists and black activists. She felt that both movements could learn from each other and form an alliance and borrow each other's methods. And she just like wanted everybody to realize that oppression was oppression. Yeah. Like it wasn't about like comparing suffering. Um, Betty for Dan was a real bitch to her. Um, Dealt with a lot of, a lot of shit from her. Really? Yeah. About what? Um, About like enough with this like black shit. Like we're here for the Mm. feminist. Yeah. It was like that kind of stuff. Um, and then, but at the same time, um, she also, Flo also got yelled at by the Black Panthers when she invited two white women to a meeting. Oh. 
So it kind of like, you so know, went both ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but Flo said uh, when she, she, this is how she described herself. I'm just a loud mouthed, <coughs> middle aged colored lady with a fused spine and three feet of intestines missing. And a lot of people think I'm crazy. Maybe you do too, but I never stop to wonder why I'm not like other people. The mystery to me is why more people aren't like me. Damn. She's awesome. She was she was so awesome. She has her. an autobiography. Where too. are her intestines? <laughs> Great <laughs> <That's> question. question. <laughs> Where did they go? Great question. But I'm sure wherever they are, they're making change. Yeah. Um, wow. And then in the year 2000, she died at the age of mm. 84 in New York City. Wow. Flo, not the progressive lady. Florence Kennedy. Florence Kennedy. So it's a very, I mean, like, I could go, if I had you know infinite time i would just write and write about her you should i don't have that much time oh, i know <laughs> but maybe like you should write about her maybe one day um all Let's right go. well i'm gonna i'll do mine quick because i think no, we're no. go. well it's i whatever. have to go home oh, um okay. <laughs> i have to take the subway you know it's hard I but know. this one's i don't think it'll be that long anyway okay, um i kept feeling like i was doing i don't know why i always explain before i do them oh wait what were your sources mm. I'll, so I'll explain why you open your computer. Yeah. But I always, I just, I do feel like I, I lean towards U.S. history so much. Sure. Because it's like more comfortable for me. So I'm trying to push myself into more international waters. So okay. my sources were, I didn't write them down, but I still have all my tabs up. Um, Solidarity, The Lasting Legacy of Florence Kennedy, Black Feminist Fighter by Sherry Randolph. Um, the New York Times, uh, her obituary uh, by Douglas Martin. Um, the New York Times again uh, about the 70 abor- 1970 abortion law. New York said yes, stunning the nation. Written by Richard Perez Pena. I feel like that's probably Pena and they didn't put the little thing on it. Mm. Um, the uh, Atlas Obscura about the late the great Harvard PN of uh, 1973 by Eric Grindhauser <laughs> Wikipedia of course and I think that's it yeah cool. that's it oh god sorry okay. oh and also the way I got the idea was from the Nod podcast mm. oh what's that um, it's this podcast on Gimlet Media about uh, it's like it's hosted by two black people. It's sort of like black culture and black history, but cool. um, they do a great job of explaining things to people like me who mm. like, may, not, may not know. And they have a segment where um, they, I guess like George Washington Carver, everybody, the only thing every, anybody remembers about him is that he invented peanut Peanuts. butter. Um, so they have a segment where they try to eat as much peanut butter as they can while telling an unknown a uh, story from black history. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. And so she did the Harper PN. Oh, cool. All right. Well, my person is Mirabai. Um, she is a 16th century Indian poet, singer, saint. Oh, yes. She, uh, there's not like so a lot of, because she was born in like 15th, 16th century India there's like not so much known about ooh damn Shaki coming with the champs you got Thank champagne you. now oh, wait I want to finish this say something interesting <clears throat> technically it's sparkly wine that was really good that was maybe the least interesting thing no I that was said really there. interesting look you did it you did it thank, thank you Shaki. Shaki wow ooh I didn't realize we were celebrating <laughs> I don't we're think you heard that, on, but he's an MLK. <laughs> we're recording on MLK Day, so we're popping champagne as you do to celebrate the great late Martin Luther King. Anyway, um, so Mirabai was so a lot of her life is like stories and like oral history and mm-hmm. like there's a lot of it's a little a little mushy, but basically. She was born around the start of the 16th century in Rajasthan, which is like a state in Western India. And her family was aristocratic of a very high caste. Her father was the descendant of a man named Rao Rator, who was the founder of a, a princely state in India called, okay. oh, that I will not pronounce, um, <laughs> <laughs> Jodhapur, maybe? Anyway, but her family was like very well to do. Um, at the age of three, a wandering holy man, they call, uh, called a sadhu, S-A-D-H-U, um, came to their home and gave Mirabai a doll of Sri Krishna. 
and Sri Krishna, if you don't know, Krishna is um well I I didn't either. I'd like heard the name. It's like you know you hear like Hare Krishna yeah. and stuff like that. So basically Krishna Krishna in Hindu is he's like a a a, Hind, a major Hindu deity and I feel, I don't want to like entirely fuck this up. It was a little confusing to like read about, but basically he's a Hindu deity. He's like the, pe- people like Hindu people think that he's a direct descendant of God. Mm-hmm. Um sort of an avatar of god <laughs> that's what it said in wikipedia okay. i don't know okay. um not like the movie but like the word um and he's the god of compassion his tail into god <laughs> yeah exactly into a big tree no um but he's the god of compassion tenderness and love and he he's part of like the bhakti like he's he's like someone who who uh popularized the bhakti form of hinduism with like this mystical form of hinduism mm. and so basically it, it bhakti it says that like you can approach god through pure love without restrictions of caste color or gender and many of um krishna's followers who are bhakti or believe i don't know how the right way to say it but who follow like bhakti practices will give up a lot of their worldly possessions and you know become wandering teachers okay which is kind of like i mean i think the Hari krishna thing is like a version of it that became that's like what like what white people took from it kind <laughs> of like i'm not sure how closely related to the original it is but it it that that thing of like of giving up your possessions and just like becoming a teacher and becoming like a, yeah. sort of a, a you know the Hare Krishnas used to feed me in New Orleans all the time yeah they do they do feed you well they, that's one of their tenants is, is to like feed people is to try to end hunger yeah so that's why they had oh okay free there you food go. every whatever Sunday day. Was it it was, Sunday? yeah in New Orleans I think they do it in, in other cities they do it on different yeah. days but it yeah so close to there that's awesome that's I only cool. went like a few times I should have gone more it was really cool time. it was great yeah that was so anyway but it's just a really like they're very chill good it's very chill and good okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a religion that's like yeah bro very it's like all it's like a religion that I think I mean I don't know maybe I don't know enough to say this blanketly but I feel like a lot of religions get real messy and this one seems pretty name one <laughs> <laughs> seems pretty chill but I don't know um correct me if I'm entirely ignorant see this is why I usually stick to U.S. Yeah, history because yeah. I feel generally like I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about and it's really hard to like understand it all in it's a short time it's hard to delve into a whole other Culture. culture in like a few hours and so. then summarize it and teach it yeah so i'm sorry if i'm but anyway i'll just get back to her life which is a little easier to to follow so she gets so a doll she gets this, this doll of Sri krishna and she's like immediately enamored with the doll and her dad like thinks that she shouldn't have the doll because she's not going to appreciate it like they're grateful that like that you're this guy got it yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> but the opposite because it's like the definition of a worldly possession yeah. <laughs> it's like a blood diamond ah. for sure i mean it's old but for sure bloody <laughs> so whoops um anyway but no so but she like wants it so badly she's so enamored with it that she like s- refuses to eat until she gets it and wow. she's like she goes on a, a hunger kid, strike yeah to like get this doll so she gets the doll and she, from a young age she's like de- decides to like devote her life to krishna and her mom is very supportive of her spiritual pursuits, but unfortunately her mom dies young. So like my mom would be if I converted to Christianity. <laughs> right. She'd be very <laughs> supportive of your spiritual disputes, but no, know she that would you die would young. give her. Yeah, she would die young. <laughs> um, so basically her father marries her off around 1516. Her father marries mm-hmm. her off to a, to Prince. Okay. Bahoj Raj, it's B H O J, last name R A J. Um, okay. He's a very influential. Uh, he's very influential in terms of like Hindu families, and their marriage raises her status. So this is like a mm. big marriage for her. Um, and but immediately, like from day one, like this is a mess. It's a mess. She doesn't want to be there. She wants to. She has told herself that she's married to Krishna. She's like decided that she's married mm-hmm. to Krishna. And so, like, she, from the jump, it's messy. And his family, the her in-laws, like, don't like her. So, also, like, she's 15. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's that's, hard to like a 15 year It's also, yeah. Um, I don't know if she was 15. Did I say that? I think she oh, probably yeah. just was. I didn't say that. But she probably yeah, was. I thought you said 15 15, 16. 16 was the year. 
Oh. But I don't know what year she was born. I thought you were saying she was 15 or 16. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. That's That's the year. Got it. But she probably was pretty young. I mean, yeah. Okay. I'm sure she wasn't super old. Anyway, but so she refuses to worship her husband's family's God because she's already married to Krishna. She refuses Mm -hmm. gifts. Like when they try and give her gifts of like silk or jewels, she's like, no, that's not for me. Um, she spends her nights like singing devotions to Krishna every single night so strongly that she enters states of ecstasy and trance. Like she's like, she's like really into this Krishna stuff. So there's (laughs) one source that said that she was like a pretty devoted wife, but then at night she would just spend like any of her free time. She would like be all about Krishna. Um, and she insisted on spending time with communities of bhaktas. So, like, she would talk to holy men. So, she would, like, talk to other men, mm-hmm. which is, like, not, you're not supposed to do that. Okay. But it was, like, because she was talking to them about Krishna. And then she would also, like, have some of these, like, like ecstasy-filled, like, like, singing sessions, like, in public, which was also sort of embarrassing for his, for the in-laws' family. That I, I'm kind of on their side. <laughs> <laughs> she kind of seems like a mess. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's like not my kind of person, but she's like, whatever. She was devoted to this thing, but she, you know, was in her circumstances. She didn't have the freedom to do what she really wanted to do. Right. So she became famous across India for how devote she wa- how like devout she was. And she wrote a ton of poems that became devotional songs or Bahajans. Oh God. B H A J A N S. Devotional songs is the translation. That sounds very similar to the man's name who she married. The prince. Oh, yeah. His name was Bahajraj, I think. Bahaj. I don't know. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Um, You're doing great. Names. Look, again. God. It's the whole foreign thing. You're doing great. This is why I do all American history. (laughs) No, I like learning about it. We're trying to branch out here. Um, Okay. So. Yes. So it was interesting, I thought. Anyway, so she so she she's like a she's a famous poet. Like that's some, something she's known for and like Gandhi, she's like she, at one thing I said saw that she was like the most famous, like one of the most frequently quoted women in Indian history. Mm-hmm. Like she's she's you know, a very intense poet. So a lot of her poems are about pay bathrooms. Yeah, pay. <laughs> 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 the thing she's mo- they're like a less that would be like way more exciting no they're all about krishna they're like they're like teen it's like it's like when you fall in love with a guy when you're like 16 and you like write poems mm-hmm. about him but it's like that carson van sanford all car excuse me what's his name carson van sanford yeah man that's sounds like a, like a cartoon he was a beautiful man yeah well, anyway, he sounds Aryan as hell. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, but the, it's like it's like she's all of her poems are like to Krishna like that. It's like I'll never love anyone else. Like you're my number one. Mm-hmm. But like way more beautiful <laughs> than that. Um, but anyway, so they're, they tr- they become songs and people start singing them all over northern India. Mm. And um, at one point, her her fame and spirituality reaches the Mughal emperor Akbar. Oh, she who, went viral. Yeah, she went viral for like 16th century india for sure um who was muslim and therefore the arch enemy of the Whoa. of her fa- of her in-law family um but he was muslim but he was interested in different religious paths and he heard about her and he was like enamored by her and wanted to meet her but he knew he could never go to their house right because they're enemies right. so he disguises himself as a beggar Oh, and goes yes. to see her and like lays jewels at her feet and then her husband finds out that he that she met his arch enemy and nothing happened he just like wanted to know about her like religious teachings or whatever um but he was not happy so he ordered her to drown her to drown herself Whoa, what yeah he was what? like i order you to drown yourself you're a bad She's wife like, now nah, i'm good and mirabai was like was like okay she was like i guess so i'm a wife that's what i have to do <laughs> so she goes so she goes to drown herself and a bunch of her followers don't worry it's not over okay. <laughs> spoiler um so she goes to drown herself and like a bunch of her followers come and then this i don't know i'm not religious so this feels like a funny trick but maybe it really happened but then she gets she's like about to drown herself and then krishna comes and is like the no. krishna i mean i don't know <laughs> like 
<laughs> I'm not religious, so for me, it seems like she was just like, nah, Krishna said. <laughs> oh, like, she's like, he's speaking to me. <laughs> yeah. So, like, Krishna comes, and Krishna's like, no, you shouldn't Don't drown do yourself. <laughs> I love you. Um, <laughs> go to this place, Brindaban, which is, like, this place where you can worship freely. It's, like, where I'm from or whatever. So, she doesn't drown herself <laughs> she just goes to this place she like, escapes to this place and eventually the husband like feels bad because he thinks maybe she really is a saint and then the fa- his family is like even less happy then soon after that <laughs> her husband dies and it, things are even worse because now she's just stuck with mm. this family that hates her yeah. and so <laughs> they the family is like all right well the tradition is that you have to throw yourself onto the burning corpse of your husband <laughs> Why, why does everything end with her having to kill herself? They, they try and kill her a bunch, man. So, <laughs> dude, they're just trying to try it. So it's like, the, on the, you're supposed to throw yourself on the funeral pyre, which I kept reading that word. I was like, I don't know what that is. I looked it up and I was like, oh, the like explosive material used to burn a corpse. Okay. Jesus. So she's supposed to throw just herself on her that. Just off to the brother or something. Yeah. Or just let her go. Just let her go. She doesn't even want to I mean, be yes, here. I mean, obviously that. <laughs> but like, if we're, if we're talking yeah. in terms of like religious ancient well, they shit. They, they want her gone. She's a mess right. like, to them. She's like a huge problem. She doesn't want, he doesn't want those. Again. So she's like, no, because... I'm mar- I'm not my husband didn't die my husband is Krishna. Ah, <laughs> so she's like, baby. No. Um so this family like What's locks her, name her again? up. Uh, Mirabai. Mirabai. Okay. Her family I wanted to be like good for you Mirabai. Yeah, it's spelled like multiple different ways and different things, but anyway, his family locks her up and tries to kill her twice, sure. once by snake and once by poison, but Krishna always has her back and she doesn't die. I don't know how. Um Eventually, she escapes back to Brindavan to worship freely. Um, there was one th- source that said that she like went back to her family at one point, but they rejected her too. Pretty much, she just spends the rest of her life devoted to Krishna, in like in in the like penniless form that she wants to be. Mm-hmm. She becomes like a beggar and just teaches and and practices spirituality, uh, bhakti spirituality. Um, And apparently, like, there's all these accounts that her spirituality was infectious. Like, she was just a really, like, she was, like, a great saleswoman for it. She was, like, really, like, it, like, just everything she said, like, everything she said, she believed and she embodied. She was just, like, someone who radiated love and kindness. And there's one story of her going to a spiritual master who refused to speak to her because she was a woman. And she said to him that the only man is Krishna and everyone else is just a follower. Yeah. And he was like, okay, that's wise. Touche. You can be my student. So then she was his student. Oh, wow. Um, and yeah, much of what is known from her comes from her poems, which are duh about Krishna, um, <laughs> missing him, the ecstasy of union with him, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there, I was going to read one, but like, they're like, I don't know. Poems are goofy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If but, you don't really believe in what you're saying, you can't read a poem. I mean, they're really beautiful. I, I mean, I should find one, whatever, but. We'll post it. Yeah, we'll, we'll post, post one. It they're beautiful. And they are beautiful. It. Like, they're the words are really gorgeous but they're all just about how much she loves krishna yeah. which is cool you know but um but they're they are gorgeous anyway uh so but they're still sung today as as songs um and yeah she just is like a very influential figure in indian history and in like hindu history and bhakti history because she is someone who was born into so much wealth and so much privilege and she gave it all up mm. because she felt really connected to this spirituality and so it's like she was it was a, I guess it was a time when there was a lot of war and a lot of religious decline and she was sort of like a, a shining spiritual light during that time um yeah and it doesn't say anything like specific about when or where she died but basically she just lived out the rest of her life as like a, a devotee to Krishna and then there's like one thing you know I feel like there was some other some other person I did who, who was like this where it was like they said that she Oh, it was a, some Native American woman I did who was like, she, when she died, she became a coyote or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, was like, mm-hmm. it was like something like that where you're like, I don't know, but okay. Yeah. But this said, there was one thing that was like, when she died, she was in a prayer session and Krishna opened his heart to her and she merged bodies with him or something. And you're like, sure. Okay, maybe. I don't know. Sure. I, mean, I wasn't there. Uh, who am I to say? But 
Anyway, whatever so. I I believe that whatever you believe is true is true yeah. for you. <laughs> That's very problematic. Why? Because like Trump, <laughs> like whatever Trump believes is true spiritually. for him. Spiritually, I don't think he believes that. Oh, spiritually. spiritually. Yeah, spiritually. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, not, not just like in, in the terms world. Of like racism. No. <laughs> You're like no. I mean. no. He is wrong. Yeah, but then also then it's also problematic because like a lot of people's beliefs mean that they treat people badly right but that's why i think it's only true for you it shouldn't have to any impact on anyone else right I agree it doesn't with that. i'm i'm taking the voodoo route of like voodoo yeah. only works if you believe in if voodoo. You believe voodoo yeah like i think whatever you think like if you believe in heaven you're gonna then go to you heaven. get heaven if you don't if you believe like it's hmm. just nothing then it's that's just nice. nothing yeah then it'll just be nothing which me, like I i'm fine with that yeah. i don't want to go to- heaven sounds exhausting yeah, yeah i just gotta yeah. be happy all the time yeah that's not me that's not your heaven though your heaven is just like, my heaven is nothing your heaven is probably like you and bamford on a couch my heaven is just sleep <laughs> <laughs> me too I- am i depressed <laughs> <laughs> oh god well that, that was, was my person mira, mira bye, bye. I'm, I'm deeply sorry Mira, hello, um, Mira, for all goodbye. the things I've definitely said wrong, but I did my best. I'm trying great. to do some international ones for the next few because I, really liked I it. do feel like I like focus so strongly on uh, on the national. Um, I'm going to get my phone while you read your okay, dates. Yeah, I'd- here are my dates. This is coming out on the 22nd. So on the 23rd, tomorrow, Tuesday, at 7.30, I will be hosting a show with Liz McGee at QED in Astoria. Um, Thursday, I'm taking my first citizenship test for Spain, which you don't need to know about, but just... That's exciting. You know, I'm so... That's like one of the things that I was th- when I finished this packet at 4.30 in the morning oh and then wrote up this lady, I was like, all right, and now... I can study, study for my so, is the test. Is the test hard? It's just really long. Really? Well, I think the first one isn't long, but the the range of questions that they can ask mm. is why. So I don't know what those get. flashcards are. Damn. Um, oh, uh, on Saturday, the 27th, I will be again at QED at nine o'clock. Mm hmm. Um and January thirty first, which is a Wednesday, I'll be at. That can't be right. Is it really called that? <laughs> Club <laughs> Club Coming. Yeah, it's Alan Cummings' <laughs> venue. Ah, okay. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, is that the name of the show? Um, um no, that's like really. I really want to go there. I haven't been there yet. I well, hear you it's really cool. Well, you should come with me on the thirty first at eight o'clock. Yeah. Um, in New York. That's and great. That's are. so funny. <laughs> Is that really what it's called? Yes. What you got? You want me to? Oh, I sorry. Um, <laughs> I only have one spot that week. It's Sunday. I'm doing If You Build It at UCB Ace, UCB East on the 28th. Um, and yeah. Uh, otherwise, please rate, review, subscribe. If you ha- if you're listening and you don't subscribe or you haven't reviewed, even if you just leave us five stars and just say one little just be like Great. word. It's so 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 helpful. Please 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 do I'd be it. Like, Funny. Yeah. You know more That's details it. better. And if you have suggestions or anything, you can send them to us at wellbehavedpod at gmail dot com or tweet at us at wellbehavedpod. Um, but please review us join the facebook it helps us so much like the page on facebook yeah. well behaved podcast um but and yeah this was a long one i think there you go you're welcome great. all right so fun well keep, keep making, making history, history. <laughs> <laughs>